River Treaty, it was entered into in, in 1964, that's when it was ratified, and it had two purposes, joint production of hydropower and assured flood control. And what it resulted in was the building of three dams in Canada that would accomplish that. Most of the main stem dams in the United States are what are referred to as run of the river dams, with the exception of large storage reservoirs like Grand Coulee. Most of them pass water through and produce hydropower. So the thought was if you could control when some of the water comes through, you can produce hydropower when you either need it or when you can sell it for the highest dollar value. So the dams in Canada became the opportunity to do that. And by putting these dams in in Colombia, we would also be able to reduce the potential for flooding on the Columbia River. And in fact, there's been no major damage from flooding since those dams went in. Basically what it's done is, is um, in all the time that it's existed, it, it did the two things it was designed to do really, really well. It, it uh, managed for flood control and for hydropower. Uh, we uh, thought about the benefits in the basin rather than just allocating water. Uh, we, uh, at the time, critical um, programs were developed, uh, which included hydropower for development of the entire Pacific Northwest, uh, and flood control. The availability of the, the huge volume of storage in Canada for management of floods um, gave both the United States and Canada a much higher degree of certainty in terms of, of how we could manage high volumes of runoff you know, flood events when they occur. Uh, without the Canadian storage, we wouldn't have that certainty. There would be much riskier, uh, much more uncertain management for floods. Certainty is also the case for, for power development. Uh, the Canadian operation provides certainty of, of management flows and releases, not just in the Canadian projects, but all the way down through the system where it generates more power. So um, I think that's the key thing. Uh, just, just both nations knowing and being able to coordinate and cooperate on management in the river and the certainty that that provides. At the operating level, it is fantastic, really. I mean, there, to be part of the, of the actual workings of the treaty, the, the trust that has been built up over the years, just little things like uh, when the committee meets now, they often bring family with them, and uh, once a year they have a sort of summer meeting and they bring family with them, and, and they enjoy each other's company on a personal basis. We've never had a dispute that uh, was had to go outside of the treaty organization. It's really fun that to see that level of cooperation that has grown from uh, sort of almost independence on either side of the border to one of mutual respect and an operation that meets the needs of both countries. Uh, we have a, a history of cooperation on the Columbia between Canada and the United States uh, that's, uh, that spans before the, the Columbia River Treaty was ratified in 1964 uh, and it's, a, it's been a beneficial, it's been a positive uh, relationship and I think we've looked at the river system and in the, the true way that neighbors should look at a, a water course and we've talked about sharing the benefits. It was cooperation uh, in an international way that would bring greater benefits of power and flood control than you could get if each nation acted. assumed that there would be much larger growth than actually took place, uh, the treaty studies, and the treaty studies also assumed that there would be huge uh, installations of nuclear power, and uh, in the end that didn't happen. So uh, the biggest change that we've actually seen is slower load growth than expected, which is a surprise because we've had huge load growth, it was just that they expected unrealistic amounts, I think. The other big change that's ha happened over my career is the uh, concern with the environment. Uh, there was very little concern really. The, the, the concern at the time of the treaty was more with uh, people and people, uh, human activity, uh, not necessarily with the extent of the environment. The Columbia is really being, in the US, is really being operated for salmon. Its power is secondary, whereas the treaty always assumed that power would be the primary objective uh, with flood control actually taking priority but being less important financially than the power side. So that's been a big change. 
when we look at the river system, it's altered completely. Basically, reservoir dam, reservoir dam, with some sections in between, but they're controlled upstream and downstream by uh, 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 dam facilities. So when we look at the system now, it is a managed system. We make uh, decisions. Humans control what happens with the waters of the Columbia. We decide when it's going to flow. Uh, that has been very negative for the, uh, the environment, for the fisheries, and a lot of work in the last little while has been put into restoring salmon and other species into the Columbia. All of a sudden, a whole lot of people came to the Pacific Northwest, and, and all of a sudden those habitats that used to be pretty um, pristine are now being affected by human habitation, whether it's from water withdrawals or loss of wetlands or land use practices. It's affecting the salmon all over uh, the, the basin. So we're starting to realize the human footprint has gotten uh, considerably greater over the past 30, 40 years. There's a value in having salmon that are produced in the wild as opposed to being produced in a hatchery. So the values have changed and the river is not, it ain't what it used to be. Some of the side effects of, of creating this treaty also uh, gave an opportunity for development. Uh, within the floodplain areas along the Columbia and the lower Columbia River. All the smolts have to come here and then uh, basically park for a, a, a few weeks to a month uh, to be able to um, transform to the saltwater environment. And during that time, that they need space. And, and some of that space is taken away when uh, side channel habitat and uh, a lot of the areas they used to come to are not there anymore. Two of the major changes that have occurred since 1964 are the expectation of public participation, the way that laws are passed, the expectation for having a say in how something like the Columbia River has operated have changed dramatically, and that is a global change in at least democratic societies. And the other thing is empowerment within the basin. The basin in 1964 uh, did not have a lot of political clout. A lot of the decisions were made in the U.S. at the federal level and were made in Canada on the coast in, in Vancouver, British Columbia. And today, that has changed. The First Nations and the Native Americans within the United States have much more capacity to participate. They've become, on the U.S. side, co-managers of the anadromous fishery. Um, and then the states have become economically more viable and much more engaged in deciding or wanting to decide what happens with the rivers that flow through them. So, so those, the capacity and the desire for public participation really changes the playing field now from what it was in 1964. If I ask myself, would it be possible today to have developed and negotiated this treaty? I mean, obviously, there's a much larger population. The, the, uh, resources and issues of concern are much more complex than there were before. Many more players and a much greater degree of expectation amongst the, the other sovereigns and the stakeholders in the region that they will participate in decision processes. So yeah, you kind of wonder, could we have actually done that treaty today? Regardless of the decision we make about the treaty, there are some fundamental changes in the way we're going to operate the system after 2024 to provide flood storage, flood management, and uh, the, the treaty itself lays down how some of that's going to be done, but there's a lot of details left to be worked out. That fundamental change in the way we operate for flood control will be huge after 2024. But that's ignited this whole different conversation about looking at the Columbia, not just the Columbia River Treaty and management and what we might want to do in the future. Not to say that, that major changes have to be made, but it's an opportunity to think about these major changes. And what can we do better? How do we improve the management system? So the Columbia River Treaty 
uh, framework and this, this process that we're undertaking now has uh, ignited a larger discourse and dialogue and thinking around a number of different issues whose time has come for us to address. The treaty doesn't have any ending point other than those flood control provisions. But if either country wants to terminate the treaty, they the earliest date they can do it is 2024 and they have to give 10 years notice. So 2014 becomes this magic number that if in looking at the expiration of the flood control and thinking about changes that have occurred in the basin since 1964, if that would lead either side to terminate, 2014 is sort of the obvious date on which to make that decision. And so what that has led to is what is referred to as the 2014-2024 review, which the, the major operating entities for the Columbia River Treaty on each side of the border are undertaking to try and understand what the implications of expiration of the flood control are. There's a certain assumption out there that, that uh, we are going to renegotiate a Columbia River Treaty, and we have to emphasize to people that, that um, there's nothing about the, the, the treaty that requires a renegotiation. The treaty will continue on indefinitely unless either the United States or Canada opts to terminate. Uh, and once we terminate, there's no guarantee that we can renegotiate. There's some things that are happening with the treaty review, such as uh, you know these dates, 2014, 2024, that have awoken uh, people to the realization that we need to think about the future of the management of the Columbia. There's some decisions that need to be made uh, uh, with respect to the treaty, and the treaty can continue on in perpetuity and, uh, uh, and uh, stay in place, but that's a decision that you have to make, a decision not to terminate. So in 2024, um, there are a number of different paths that the discussions could take that lead to changes in 2024. The types of things that have been studied so far are fairly narrowly limited to the existing treaty, what would happen if we simply extended the flood control provisions and, and had operation as it is now, what would happen if we do nothing, let the flood control provisions, assured flood control, expire and go with the rest of the treaty. Um, what would happen if we terminate the treaty? So that's been kind of the narrow group of, of um, alternatives that have been looked at. Then what people in the basin are starting to ask to be looked at is what would happen if either through amending the treaty or through some kind of agreement like the Libby Coordination Agreement, we started to look more at ecosystem function. The question is, do you need to amend the treaty? Do you need a new treaty? Or can you do it through a protocol? A huge opportunity coming from a region is to engage the sovereign entities, the states, the tribes, the federal agencies, and all the other stakeholders in the region in this dialogue. Any long-term solution related to the treaty has to be developed in conjunction with this outreach effort. I mean, there's no way that we could expect a recommendation that we send forward 2013 or 2014 regarding the future of the treaty to be accepted if it, if it isn't developed in conjunction with the other key partners throughout the region. federal agencies on the U.S. side, the provincial agencies on the British Columbia side are sort of constrained to their side of the border for taking public input and for involving the various sovereign entities. We probably have more in common within the basin on both sides of the borders than would be reflected by the 49th parallel. So having an opportunity to have that dialogue within the basin um, was something that, that people felt would be really beneficial to the review of the treaty. We need to have many dialogue tables 
that are, that are actively looking at these issues because innovation and thought can come from many different areas. The university's consortium uh, allows us to have a table to have a dialogue and discourse that perhaps can inform decision makers and inform those that are heavily involved in, in, in managing the river itself and to think from a different perspective and maybe a unique perspective because that's what we're going to need. We're going to need some people from out of the box thinking about how we can solve some of our, our emerging and future issues. All of these kinds of things are, are uh, helping us craft a regional conversation where the outcome is likely to have been much more inclusive on the front end, which means it'll be much more representative on the back end. The river is the lifeblood for a lot of us. The Columbia River is the only sea level passage to the inland, so barges come up and down the river. Uh, highways on either side of the river are a major transportation corridor, um, and the railroads on both sides of the river. Not only are we interested in the Columbia in the estuary, but some of the major tributaries are very vital um, in regards to uh, resource protection and uh, for the tribal members um, to be able to continue their, their cultural practices such as harvesting fish. Um, my family's been in the Oregon Territory for about four generations, so my kids are the fifth generation. Uh, it's just a beautiful place to recreate. Uh, it's close to the city, it's close to the mountains, cl close to the beach, and uh, I am printed here. So for me, this, this is my home. I think it, you know, I, I do enjoy to, to go out fishing uh, and, and taking my uh, kids out fishing. Um, you know, I, I think I, I did, when I really felt the breath of it is when I took to a trip to Alaska to go fishing up there and to see so many fish that are up there in comparison uh, to what I've seen here. It, you know, it, it, it's a driving factor to try to restore the species down here so, so we can basically, you know, hopefully the goal is to walk on the backs of salmon um, across that Columbia River, if, if possible, here in 20 years or so. Irrigation for our agriculture, which in Washington and Oregon is a huge economic driver. Uh, is also part of that. It, it feeds the land as well as us. So the river is not only a beautiful place but an economic, a recreational, a nurturing and an environmental force in the area that is uh, central to the region. You know at a very personal level um, I feel very deeply tied to water. I'm a, I'm a fly fisherman and, and uh, all the waters in the northwest drain into the Columbia River. It's the, the mother of all our watersheds, but um, I've always been very interested in water and water resource planning. That's why I'm in this professional field. And, and from a professional perspective, I mean, what could be more fun for a water resource planner than to be involved in this kind of very important effort? I'm just a small cog in the wheel. But I feel very personally that, that in terms of the success of the treaty, it's not as if it's a, an academic exercise for me. It's something I've lived. It was 30 years of my working career, and it's been eight years since. And so, yes, I've been involved in it. Um, I think it's doing incredible good for the, for the entire region. I mean, that energy that's coming is renewable energy. It's, it's, it's helping in terms of greenhouse gases. I happen to be one of the believers in in global warming and so I mean it makes a contribution towards that. I've got grandkids, uh, I think it adds to the world that they'll inherit and so I've got a whole lot of very personal reasons that, uh, that and this is one area that I can hopefully get remain involved in that I think uh, will carry through those benefits to the next generation. I have a long history in the Columbia Basin uh, in fact, uh, we were one of the residents. Uh, my parents and family were flooded out by the Columbia River Treaty dams, in particular the Hukini side dam. And ever since then, I've been keenly interested in the basin. I've worked in the entire basin. 
uh, for many years since the flooding. A lot of people left and they have never been back because they can't, they wouldn't be able to emotionally stand. They wouldn't be able to take coming back. I had a cabin there that I used to go to and I actually watched the clearing and watched the water come up. And I've got actually pictures of the stumps and the water coming up in flooding areas and what you picture, oh, well, that's where our home used to be and now there's so much water. And For us in the gorge, if you, uh, if there are no towns, then uh, part of its vitality has been lost. Recreation would be much more difficult because there wouldn't be towns to support it. However, if the resources were decimated, the recreation and the towns wouldn't thrive. So it, it really requires both, protection of both, to have a vibrant economy and that's what makes the quality of life here so unique. I love to get out uh, and just float stretches of it and especially um, stretches of it where um, you've got, well actually two different kinds of ways because there's stretches of it that are very um, you know, you're in a natural setting and birds, I love the birds and the, and the edges to the, the rivers and moving through things. But I also like to kayak through the, the places that have been developed. I like the human development along the river. I like getting out um, around here, for example, I like going down along Sobe Island, uh, which is where the Willamette comes into Columbia and you get this wonderful mix of, of the trees and the coves and the creeks and the birds and then you'll have a giant ship go by and you've got a grain loading facility that you go by um, and, and it gives you a good sense of how the river uh, has worked with the human settlement here and that's um, besides the exercise part of it that's what I look for when I kayak and I do a lot of that and uh, I go to these meetings and I often haul my kayak with me. You know I'd like to say everything we do I mean we're walking pads of water so everything I do uh, recreationally is about water so uh, we're always out there uh, uh, with my family we're always on the water uh, whether it's in the, in the Columbia wetlands or whether we're out on a reservoir, uh, we enjoy uh, being around the area. It's beautiful, uh, so it's, it's really part of our lifestyle. And the other part of it is I understand that it is the foundation of our economy too. So I have a perverse professional uh, uh, interest in being out there and watching the management of our reservoirs and seeing how our management decisions, what it means on the ground. It's one thing to sit in an office uh, on a teleconference, on a video conference in front of a computer screen and talk about how uh, the dams are managed, how we manage flows. It's another thing to be at a dam and to watch the water come out or to uh, behind it at a reservoir to watch the water levels go up and down and to see how that actually changes the landscape and what, uh, what, uh, what happens with that. I'm a Shushwap Indian, so be basically being a Shushwap Indian, um, Salmon is the basis and the backbone of our culture. It's uh, akin, I guess, to Jesus Christ almost to, to the Catholics or something like that, right? Uh, reverence for salmon is very, very high. Stories relate to how many of the fish were based on the fact that the natives used to walk across their backs. It was that, it was that uh, big of a run. Um, there is no more salmon now in the uh, headwaters of the Columbia or even anywhere in the Canadian side of the Columbia and the fact that they're gone now for 70 years has had a very, very drastic impact on my people. Um, um, being at 70 years of loss of salmon has, um, along with that, has gone our um, ceremonial uses and things like that that went with salmon. The ability uh, to educate our children on processing techniques, capture techniques, um, first salmon ceremonies, things like that. So, yeah, um, that's kind of who I am in a nutshell. Traditionally, we would um, came up and a lot of our, our ancestors came up and fished in Revelstoke. Um, the salmon stopping there, uh, the caribou herds, we used to have in our territory um, low bush caribou. And our elders, and even my dad talked about when he was young, he was born in 1901, but when he was um, 13, going up there with the elders and doing the hunt through our traditional territory and having to wait almost an hour of time for the caribou herd to go through. And now there is none. They're totally extinct and that was from the flooding of the up channels and that's so they couldn't migrate from the areas that they were because of the um, water hold back in the reservoirs. See, but the people ask, like I was asked to come and work 
when we first uh, did the Arrow Lakes generating station and Brett and Tadno have seen now this we needed to come and work on these projects. I thought, why would I do that? Like how do I like they flooded me out? And I thought, no, I'm gonna go because the project we build are gonna be different. We did fish enhancement with part of our project. That's where we did like we did all kinds of things. The project built in all of this these other things that they should have done maybe when they did Hugh Caney's side. You know what I mean? Like we have rehabilitated Hugh Caney's side. They just left the landscape in a mess, buried oil drums and buried crap in there that we dug out that we had to clean up. Whole, whole people were moved right out of the valley and um, record made so that they almost didn't exist no more. The other thing is non-consultation. When the first agreement came, Indian Affairs was the one that negotiated, said no, there's no effect to um, First Nations up here. And, uh, and we had no say, none of our leaders had any say at that time. The history is so rich. Everywhere you go in the in the river valley, it's uh, you know there's been a moccasin print there, whether or not it's still existent. And the people of our region uh, felt they weren't in, properly involved in the discussions, the conversation, and the decisions to build the treaty. They also felt that uh, once the treaty uh, dams were built, that they weren't properly compensated for the impacts that happened. I don't think they truly understood uh, what the impacts were going to be or how major or drastic the changes were going to be on the landscape and the lifestyle of the people of the basin. It's a very complex system. When we built these dams and we start managing, it's, it's hard to understand the inter, how everything is interlinked and how decisions are made. It's difficult to understand for people uh, to understand why Kukanusa fluctuates so much and the reasons behind it. Uh, it's hard for people to kind of understand how we use dams to try to do flow augmentation to support salmon. It's hard for people now to even understand that we block salmon by building some of the dams. We block salmon from migrating into Canada by building Grand Coulee Dam. So there's a lot of misunderstandings, but it's understandable because it's a complex system. Uh, it's big, you know, it's the size of France or Texas, the Columbia Basin from uh, its, in its entirety. And uh, so it's a large area, it takes a lifetime to understand. There's a, a, a story in the Shushwap culture about uh, um, a water monster that was fed by a salmon. And then the Shushwap Indian Band, when the salmon was cut off by the Grand Coulee Dam, that monster kind of got mad at everybody and left. And uh, that monster was responsible for caretaking of the people. And uh, now that it's gone, um, a lot of things have been happening to the people in terms of health, uh, whether it be spiritual, mental, physical. Um, as you may know, diabetes is very rampant in First Nation peoples. Uh, based on their diets nowadays, is not natural as it used to be. There's too many sugars and starches and everything else in there. They got to say no, right? We're not doing that, right? And put pressure on their governors and our politicians here and our MPs and everybody to say no. And if we do it as a combined like the people from Canada and the U.S., if we do it together, along with First Nation, we say, no, congressman, whatever. It's not going to happen. We're not going to allow this to happen. We're going to vote you out. And we'll do the same here. And if we all get together, maybe we can do something. But, you know, the thing is, you know, it's, it's, we can't let this, we can't let this happen without some input from the people and changing some things and being reasonable about it, though. You know, we understand flood control has to stay. Have to have power generation. I mean, you're, you're not going to turn people's lights out. But we, I know we can do it better. We have done it better. And all of these projects that we've built, we've done it better. In our belief, we, we have um, the creator, Kel Cookby, and he comes by never, many names all through Mother Earth. And um, we're given seven laws that teach us to be human and one responsibility. The responsibility is to speak for those that cannot speak for themselves. It's the water, the wildlife, the root people, the air, and the future generations that are not born there. And we have the responsibility to speak on the best behalf we can for them. Um, and that was a law from the Creator. So that, that's what puts my heart and my, my whole spirit into believing that doing, doing things that help in, enhance the environmental concerns and. Uh, and the welfare for the future generations um, is so strong in my heart. We're 
in an interesting position today, this year, because we have had unprecedented flooding throughout North America, Canada, the United States. It's going on right now. And I don't think that's the worst headline we face in the Columbia River Basin. Whether the treaty continues or terminates, the United States still has rights to, to storage in Canada after 2024 that if we need, we can call on and, and we'll make use of. Um, the worst thing to me would be a headline that says that there's been flooding occurred, we use the Canadian storage, and now Canada and the United States have to figure out how we're gonna deal with questions about how the United States pays for it and, and issues that would mean that we hadn't figured out how to continue to work collaboratively together. Um, the worst would, is, would be that the treaty is no longer there. It's, it's irrelevant. Uh, that would probably be the least, if it wasn't in the headlines, if it hadn't got some article anywhere, if there was, if there was no life left in the, in the, the old bird. If I read in the headlines that you know, talks broke down, we're going to carry on the way we always did, and that there's no improvement, there's always been this vision that, okay, these things happened. When the treaty's up again for renewal, let's try and, try and deal with some of the stuff that wasn't a priority then. And can't really blame anybody. A priority was power generation, economic development. That's all great. But now that we know there's other values that are coming forward and other values that are important, that we need to now figure out a way to consider those along with the power generation. Ah, uh, the worst possible headline we could have about the Columbia River is that uh, is that Canada is doing their own thing and the U.S. is doing their own thing, and we're not talking. We need increased cooperation, not less. I would like people to uh, essentially try to rise above their own particular perspective and look at the other perspectives. This river touches people at so many levels in so many ways. One of the things, the disciplines that you have when you're operating a system like that is that every Saturday there is an operation that takes place. Every Friday, they, today, there would be an email today, a, t a fax in the early days, saying this is the way we want to operate the river next week and it would be agreed on, during a conference call on the Thursday. So there's an immediacy. I mean there's that conference call on Thursday, there's an operation that clicks into place on Saturday that changes the flows on the river. This is where you set how much water goes out of different dams, how much goes through turbines and so on and it, there's an immediacy there. You can't keep debating because you have to have a decision by Saturday and it better be one that you both feel comfortable with. So you've got these different perspectives on how people would like it to be operated. And even if they were allowed to operate it uh, and were given sort of if they were given a committee with all the people on it that represented the different interests, I think they would find they would have a really, really difficult job coming up with an operation by Saturday. And I, I wish they would take that perspective and say, okay, if I have to operate this in conjunction with all these other people that share interest in the Columbia, how would I get an operation that works by Saturday? We should get all the people that care, like about the basin, like you know what I mean, like like First Nations and and people that lived on it. And we we need to tell the politicians that people are dealing. Look, we care about this, and this is what we care about, and we work together to make things happen. The best results come when you let the people who live near the water source, who use that water source, who have spiritual relations, economic relations, whatever it is to the water source, when you let them make the decision, when you let their voices be heard, that's when you see a really good agreement come out of it. What I think is the best possible scenario is that people take a long view and start working or, or making decisions that allows them to take those opportunities when they come. What happens when technology for electricity changes? What happens when we come up with different ways to manage for flood than simply putting in a dam? Um, what happens when we move people off of the floodplain, reconnect the river to the floodplain, and start to run a more natural river while still getting the energy production um, that we're getting today, just doing it in a different manner? That would be my hope for the river.
the one thing that, that always puzzles me in the Columbia is it's a, it's a very important river system to Canada and the United States, one of the most important river systems to both na nations. Um, and it's one of the most important river systems in the entire planet, and it's heavily managed. Yet we don't have a commission that looks at these major issues. We don't have uh, you know, um, a commission from Canada and the United States endorsed by the federal and provincial governments and state governments uh, that takes looks at issues and does research and provides uh, some understanding of how we can look at managing it for the agencies. And so I think we, we need an increased focus from all f facets, from the grassroots uh, to the federal and provincial levels and state levels about uh, more dialogue and talking about what we want in the future and what we can do for management in the Columbia. Everyone needs a win in this. And again, we aren't, no one is going to get what they think they want exactly, but I think that the reality is, is that both countries have to deal with this and the states and the provinces do, and it will be worked out. I, I have faith in that process and it is sticky, it's messy, but I think it'll be okay.